joining, uh, joining us today in Zona Abierta. Uh, this program is titled We Call Them Baby Girls. Uh, and this is presented in partnership with the UIC Latin American and Latino Studies. Uh, and as always, I would like to uh, send, um, give many thanks to Marta Ayala, who's always a champion in um, working with us to make sure that these programs uh, happen. Uh, this is our first Zona Abierta for this semester, so how many of you are new to Zona Abierta? Okay, a few of you, so I have to tell you what this is all about, right? <laughs> so Zona Abierta is a series of public programs that highlight the intersection of the arts, humanity, science, uh, culture, and civil life with presentations that are given by local um, national and international artists, uh, scholars, and many community leaders. Um, and, you know, they come together to uh, do presentations on pressing social issues and environmental issues as well. You know, how those affect uh, um, Latino communities not only here in Chicago, throughout uh, the country, but also in Latin American studies, in Latin American um, countries um, as well. And one of the things that we aim to do in this presentation is also to connect those struggles and their creativity with other communities uh, as well, right? Because the programs here is not only about Latino, but it's also the uh, uh, intersection among many people uh, living together. Uh, this space has a very rich history of bringing people together to talk about you know, the present issues, but also to highlight the creative ways that we are all using to resolve those everyday challenges and also to build coalition for changes. And um, this history, in particular with the mural that we have here, uh, make this a site of conscience. I always call this place un lugar de con conciencia. Uh, and es un lugar de conciencia because it constantly reminds us of our past, our history, uh, and it tries to connect their history with uh, contemporary life. Uh, but most important, what this mural and this space has done throughout time is to challenge us to reflect on the present uh, and to ask ourselves how we can shape a better future, right? So presentations like today will provide critical perspective on the present debate on immigration, but in particular around the life of women and children seeking asylum. Uh, most of them are from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. Um, their increased attention and decrease of legal protection is begging us to consider at least two questions that I think we all really have to take very seriously. The first is, how does the detention of these families reflect core values of American society? Right? And the second one is, how can we keep these families together and safe using our collective creativity and commitment for social justice? Uh, we have developed these postcards that you all have in support of DACA and TPS. And if you have not had a chance to fill one out and send it to Congress, today is the day. Please do so at the end of the day and we will mail them for you if you want us to do that. Um, I would like to thank the Latin American and Latino Studies Program for partnering with us again, and the uh, co-sponsors of this program are the UIC Institute for the Humanities Global Migration Group, um, um, Working Group, and a student organization, Heritage Garden. Um, so having said that, now I would like to give the floor to Professor Amalia Payares. She's the director of Latin American and Latino Studies program, and soon to transition to her new role as associate, this is a long title, mm -hmm. associate chancellor and vice provost for diversity. Uh, this will happen <coughs> on February 19th. 19th. Uh, so Professor Payares will introduce our presenter. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I like that word a lot, conciencia, because I, I think it's hard to think of somebody who represents that more than Virginia Martinez. It is 
an honor to have her here. And let me tell you a little bit about her. She went to UIC, she was a sociology undergrad, um, so she's an alum, and, um, and uh, she, was also, she also went to law school in um, DePaul University, and in 1975, she was one of two, the first two Latinas to be licensed to practice law in Illinois. Um, yeah. uh, there's many things I'd like to say about me. Uh, Virginia, between 1992 and 97, I can't mention them all, but in terms of her professional career, she served as the executive di director of Mujeres Latinas en Acción. Then, uh, also, it, in addition, this was in the 90s, but before that, in the 80s, she had a very long career, and then returned again to Maldives. In Maldives, in, uh, and in Maldives, she was the lead counsel in the historic redistricting. Uh, of cases of 1982. They created the first <coughs> Chicago wards and state legislative districts. Okay? Um, she was also at UIC, the former director of the International Center for Health Leadership uh, Development uh, here at UIC. She also served as legislative staff attorney in the Midwest office of MALDEF, uh, and she monitored all, in addition to the redistricting, she monitored all regional, state, and local legislation and policies affecting Latinos. Throughout her life, she has worked uh, in, in a number of capacities, both working as a professional and as a volunteer in many nonprofit organizations that serve Latinos, women, children, and the poor. And she is, for example, she's on the board of the directors of Gads Hill Center. Uh, she's state legal counsel for the League of uh, uh, Latin American United Citizens, uh, LULAC, and member of the Calor Advisory Committee, among many other things. Um, she's won many awards. She has won a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Hispanic Lawyers Association of Illinois, the Outstanding Leadership Award from the Illinois Legislative Latino Caucus Foundation, and the, Life, and the Women's Bar Association of Illinois Top Women Lawyers and Leadership Award. Okay. Um, and uh, she's also recently was appointed to the Illinois Prisoner Review Board on March 8, 2017. Uh, and uh, if this were not enough, <laughs> Virginia is also a volunteer. Um, she has been volunteering periodically with the CARA Pro Bono Project in Dilly, Texas, which is what she's going to talk to us about today, assisting women and children in detention to start their asylum process and to be released <coughs> with their relatives in the U.S. Um, and she's going to talk to us in more detail about that. I just want to say that in terms of UIC, she has always been participating and collaborating in our program. She was one of our speakers on our Mexicans in Chicago panel. She's participated in Professor Rene Gutierrez's, uh, you know, Chicanas por Mirazo, the digital archive. Her oral history can be found in an archive of her life. And one more thing I want to honor Virginia because she has requested that her honorarium for this be donated uh, to the uh, Scholarship Foundation of the Fearless and Documented Alliance. So for that, we're going to coming back to UIC. It, all, it has changed over the years. I can tell you it's changed dramatically. Um, there were no trees when I was here. Uh, <laughs> and as an attorney, I need to start with a disclaimer. I am not an immigration lawyer. I am not an expert on uh, Central America. What I'm going to talk about is my experience volunteering at the South Texas Res Family Residential Center in Dilly, Texas. Um, so I'm not an expert in asylum law. I will give you a brief overview, but that's not my area, neither Central America, and really I'm not an expert in anything. Um, <clears throat> but let me tell you how I started. Um, I, uh, in 2016, a friend of mine, Sandra Castillo, who is a retired um, Episcopal priest and retired attorney, um, told me she was going to go down to Texas to volunteer at a family detention center and asked if I wanted to go along. I said, sure. I, you know, it was a week. She said, oh, by the way, you have to pay your own expenses. They don't pay anything. I'm like, okay. Um, I called my compadre and got him to go too. So we, um, he's in, uh, in New Mexico, so he drove over so we didn't have to pay for a rental car. In any case, um, I started going, and I was so affected by that first week. When you volunteer there, it's a week at a time. I was so affected by that first week um, that I started to go every two months until I got appointed to the Prisoner Review Board, and now I try and go every six months. Um, 
the experience of that first week, um, my experience and some of the other volunteers is actually, Sandra videotaped it, and it's on um, Vimeo.com, uh, on the ground, the CARA Pro Bono Project. Um, so you can see the reactions of the volunteers. You are not allowed to take cameras inside. You're not even allowed to take a phone. So we don't have pictures. That's why there's no uh, <laughs> present, you know, uh, presentation, uh, no slides or anything. Not allowed to, to, to do that at all there. Um, but that um, video um, that Sandra took was just really captures um, the impact on the volunteers that go there. Um, you will see me cry because it was a very difficult week. I have since learned when I go back to try and not cry so much. Um, and so it, 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 it's what I do in my life anyway. I compartmentalize things. And I kind of take time to take care of myself. So, um, so I'm able to keep going. I don't understand how the staff does it on a day-to-day -day basis, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about them. Um, but let me start to, uh, first by explaining that the South Texas Residential Center in Dilly is a privately owned facility. Um, as many of you may know, a lot of prisons and immigration detention centers are now owned by private corporations. Um, their stock went way up when, after the last election. I won't say his name. After the last election, their stock went up. Um, and there's been um, a concerted effort to increase detention of immigrants and, of course, deportations, as we all know. That center um, is owned by Core Civic, and it was opened in 2014 in response to the increase um, of families seeking asylum from Central America. Um, it was then and still is. Um, families fleeing extreme violence in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. The detention center itself is actually a series of mobile units. Um, some contain offices of the asylum uh, officials. Others are court personnel for the immigration court. There's a clinic. There's a child care center. There's a school. I have no idea what kind of school that is, but they have a school there. The kids tell me they go to school. Um, and then there are housing units. So there are a number of families assigned to each housing unit. Um, but let me go back for a second and tell you that family doesn't mean family. It is women and their children. So husbands, partners, others who have come, males and uh, older teens are taken to a different detention center. So this is just women and their own children. Um, yeah, I think it's in here later, but I might as well say it now. It's women and their own children. And if they happen to be bringing um, a grandchild or a niece or a nephew, those children are taken away because it's not that woman's child. So you can imagine the impact of little children seeing a child grabbed away from their relative, their aunt, their tia, their abuela, and pulled away and taken away never to be seen by these children, at least for this period of time, never to be seen again. So these children are terrified. Um, we're not allowed to go in the back. We are only allowed to go where we work, which is the visitation center. We can, we can go to the court if we're going with a client, or we can go to the asylum office if we're going with a client to observe. We're not allowed to represent them in the asylum. Uh, process in the, the asylum office, so we go along to observe. Um, but that's the only part of the back that we're allowed to see. So I've never seen the child care center or the school or the rooms that the women have. Um, so let me talk generally about the asylum process. Uh, both international and U.S. law provide a process through which individuals from other countries who are facing persecution persecution being uh, offensive harm or suffering, so that they can enter. This includes physical violence, torture, threats, detention, discrimination, and other actions by a government, a quasi-official group, or a group or persons that the government is unable or unwilling to control. As you may know, the murder rates in the Central American countries are among the highest in the world, as are the rates of femicide. An asylum seeker either presents herself at the border 
or, and requests asylum or crosses the border and is either apprehended or turns herself into immigration agents and tells them, I'm afraid to go back to my country. Um, individuals and families are held in Border Patrol processing centers, which are known as Yeleras and Terreras, um, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And then they are usually sent to a detention center, like Dili, um, to go before an asylum officer. The asylum seeker must prove credible fear or reasonable fear, depending on what type of case it is, before being released to continue what can be a very long process in seeking asylum in the US. There's a lot more to the process, but I want to get to what I have seen myself um, over the past two years. Um, as I said, uh, the men and, and older boys are sent to a different detention center. So what we see are the um, women and their own, their own children. The Pro Bono Project is supported by the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, the American Immigration Council, the Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services, RAICES, and the American Immigration Lawyers Association, C-A-R-A, CARA. <clears throat> it operates with a small staff and volunteers who come in for a week at a time. Volunteers are attorneys, law students, social workers, um, college students, anyone who is bilingual and can serve as an interpreter in Spanish, Creole, Romanian, or other languages. While most women are from the Central American Triangle, there are some who come from Haiti, Romania, and uh, Asian countries. And volunteers pay, the, pay their own way, including hotel and transportation. Or in some cases, attorneys and law firms will pay expenses for volunteer interpreters. In my case, before I started working, my friends, I have wonderful friends, um, my friends contributed to a GoFundMe um, account that I started, and so that's how I was able to go like the second, third, and fourth time that I went. Um, as I mentioned, Dilly works out of the visitation center. Um, there's a large open space, and there we set up chairs in circles so that we can have discussions, charlas, with the women on um, different topics, intake, and, um, and the whole uh, interview process. Um, and then there are rooms around the side, which are individual rooms where we can meet with the, with the mom and sometimes her children individually um, so that they have privacy. Um, after conference call, online information, and a Sunday evening uh, training session, volunteers come in on Monday morning ready to help. The first time I volunteered, um, I volunteered to do the intake charla because I'm not an immigration attorney and I was, wasn't sure about myself uh, in terms of being able to advise these women. Um, the intake charla is designed to let women know who CARA is and how we are able to help them. We let the women know that we provide free services to them while they're in Dili. Um, we let them know what the process will be, that we are not part of the government or the detention center's administration, and we ask, ask, I, I also show them notices that they should be looking out for, which are their appointments for their interviews. We then help them fill out information sheets, which are used to create their electronic file and the way that CARA volunteers can continue to help. Um, these women and children. Um, indigenous women who come from Guatemala often do not speak Spanish, and so there are some um, audio tapes that they can listen to in some of the languages. In some languages, we have no interpreters, there's no video um, or um, audio information, and so we do the best we can to fill out information. They already have a tag on them that says, I speak mom, whatever language they speak. Um, most of the time they are released without an interview because immigration doesn't have interpreters either and then they are sent to their, um, their families or, or uh, friends who are going to receive them in the U.S. and will get their um, order to appear in court. But the others have to go through this process, this interview. Um, part of the script um, is to welcome women to the U.S. because you can imagine that no one has welcomed them. So they get all happy. Um, uh, on the contrary, most uh, have had to go through one of the Yeleras or Pereras where they have been treated horribly. 
I was appalled by what women told me about those places. They're supposed to be temporary holding places, just like the holding cells at a, a police station where um, they keep people locked up for a few hours until they process them. In fact, women and children are held there days and they're sometimes moved from one to another. They are held in freezing cold cells with no beds and sometimes barely enough room to sit or stand. They share a gross toilet and no soap. The only drinking water is so bad that some of the kids refuse to drink it. Texas is a fracking state, um, and so the water in that area is really bad. Um, and, uh, but they're forced to drink that because they're not given any bottled water. The food is the same three times a day. Frozen sandwiches or burritos, which the women say are sometimes moldy and sometimes thrown at them. Children get milk and toddlers are given baby food. Some of the women have young babies uh, with them and most of them are being breastfed. Although, um, I remember one woman telling me that um, a border patrol officer yelled at her about breastfeeding her child who was a little older, a uh, year and a half or a year old, and said, you know, you're not animals. Make that child eat right or something. You know, it just treated horribly. Women had re have reported that if the children begin to cry, the air conditioned is raised even colder. It's used as a punishment against children. <clears throat> Sometimes women and children cross through the, through the river and are brought to the Yeleras and Pereira soaking wet. <clears throat> so you can imagine, all of their um, things are taken from them except the clothes that they have on. <clears throat> so sweaters or jackets that they might have are taken from them and they're put in these freezing cold and wet, they're wet, to put in these freezing cold rooms. Not surprisingly, many um, are sick by the time they get to Dili. And so almost every time I've been there, the children are all coughing and sneezing, they're all sick. Um, and I remember one woman who told me that it was so cold and her baby was so cold that he was shivering, she took off her blouse, she had something underneath the little t-shirt, so she took off her blouse, wrapped her baby in it, and put her baby between her legs to try to keep the baby warm. Um, the first time I went, women talked about how Border Patrol agents yelled at them, called them names, refused to give them necessities such as sanitary napkins and diapers. It wasn't until I went back several times that I learned that the Border Patrol officers also yell at kids, calling them cochinos and smelly. One mom told me that her son saw a border uh, agent drinking water and asked him for some. He told the little boy to go to his mother because he smelled so bad. A child, he said this to a child. You have to know that by the time families reach the border, they have been on the road for almost a month, traveling through several countries to get to the border. They've been running and hiding from immigration officers in Mexico, gang members and others trying to rob, kidnap, and rape them. They have left sometimes without more than a few hours preparation after seeing relatives killed, being threatened, having their children threatened, being raped, or being beaten. One woman told me she had been granted release without appearing before an asylum judge, and I asked her why. That rarely happens. She said, oh, I have a good case. She pulled over her t-shirt and there was two bullet hole scars on her shoulder. So they were letting her go through because yes, she had an obviously good case. <clears throat> After hearing some of the stories, I decided to stay on intake so that I could add, to, add my apology for how they had been treated. When I welcome women, they smile. Once I ask if they've gone through a Yelera or Pereira, their smiles turn to tears. I immediately tell them things will change now that we're there, now that we're there to help them. I feel like being older, um, it helps and is somehow reassuring to women who are, could be my daughters or my granddaughters. Um, I tell them that most of the U.S. does not know what is happening at the border. Um, y que me da pena. These, um, one, of, one, of, one of the things that I tell them and one of the things that I neglected when I was explaining about CARA is that their goal is twofold. One, to help these women. The second is to try and change things by getting awareness to the rest of the United States about what happens at the border. Um, 
As a U.S. citizen, my taxes are supporting the inhumane treatment of children and families who are coming to us for safety. I tell them that. In any case, I stayed on intake for a while. I didn't want to, I actually didn't want to hear the really horrible stories um, that form the basis of their credible fear claims and their asylum claims. I was also never really confident that I could properly, lo properly load the information on the database that CARA uses. I'm really not very good with computers. Um, but eventually, I did start doing the next step, which is preparing women for their interviews with asylum officers. There was another charla in a big group um, where we let women know what the process is, and then volunteers meet individually uh, with the women and sometimes their children. We listen to the women and then help them structure their story so that it will make sense to the officer. You can imagine these women are so terrified and under such stress that um, they jump around. So we try and help them structure their story so that they can start from when the first incident happened, what happened later, how the um, threats or the violence increased, and then what finally made them leave their country. Um, I, we also let them know that um, they have to wait a few days to get a decision on their um, uh, interview. And if it's positive, they go to the next step, which is the um, uh, another charla um, for people leaving. But um, if it's negative, they can come back to the volunteers and the attorneys help them um, get a rehearing or appeal to uh, an immigration court that is there as well. Um, so, but things change um, about what is being accepted by the uh, asylum officers. So every time I go back, there's new instructions and um, help from the staff. Um, so for example, the fact that there are groups um, or that there are gangs and violence in those countries, everybody in the world knows, so that's not enough. Um, it has to be personal, uh, personal about what happened to them. And those women many times have a very difficult time talking about what has happened to them, you can imagine. Or the children, sometimes the violence has been against the children. Older children um, are brought in and they're asked questions as well. So let me say here that the staff of CARA are incredible. It's a very small staff at any given time. Maybe five people are there um, as staff. And I once saw uh, an immigration officer come in. Usually um, the, the detention center is staffed by people hired by Core Civic, so they're not um, government officials. Um, but immigration is there. Um, we just don't, re we rarely see them in the visitation center. So one day when I saw an immigration officer walk in, um, I was kind of looking around what was going to happen next, and he was actually looking for a woman who had run in, a Haitian woman who had run in and tried to hide because she was about to be deported. Um, he found her in one of the um, interview rooms and grabbed her and started taking her away, and the senior staff person from CARA um, stopped her and, and just hugged her and said, it's going to be OK, it's going to be OK. And this woman was just crying and, uh, uncontrollably. I didn't see what happened after that, except knew that there were, somebody was uh, about to be deported. I found out the next day that the staff immediately started working on their computers, started um, filing um, something in court, and were able to get I don't know if the women actually got on the plane, but they were already at the airport in San Antonio. There were three women, actually, uh, all, all three of them Haitian, um, three women that had been targeted for, for deportation that were already at the airport. And um, they were able to stop the deportation and get the women back. One of the women had to be taken to the hospital because she had some kind of condition that was immediate, and she needed immediate hospitalization. But these women and men who are the regular staff of, they usually serve for six months or a year as staff. They are incredible, and they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I, I don't know how they do it. Um, uh, when, I, when I do these uh, charlas, I also ask um, if any of the women are coming to Chicago, and if they are, I give them my phone number. Um, 
so that um, when they come, if they need help uh, finding an attorney to help them with their asylum pro process, I can help them look for an attorney. Um, I've been in contact with two women. The last time I went was in November, and two of the women, I think there were about five that came to Chicago, but two of them have contacted me. One of them has, is in contact with me almost on a daily basis now. Um, but she, uh, I was able to, again, I tell you, I have wonderful friends. I put out on Facebook that this woman was here and she needed car seats and she needed food and she needed Christmas presents and she needed clothes, she needed boots. They got all of that and money. Um, and so I was able to go around collecting these donations for her. I was also able to get her an appointment at a clinic because she apparently needs surgery um, pretty soon um, because she had been in a hospital in Texas. Uh, so, um, so the contact sometimes is ongoing. Most of the time I never see those women again. Um, but um, while, the, while the conditions in Dili are much better than the Yeleras and Perreras, and Yeleras are called Yeleras because they're freezing cold, the Perreras are cold too, but they also look like um, dog kennels. There's like, n not bars, but fence, like fences. Each, each uh, area has a, a fence around it, so they call them Perreras. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so where was I? Oh, uh, so the conditions in the in the detention center are much better. They get clothes and they get rooms, they get beds, um, they get assistance. They get um, there is a clinic there, but the medical services are limited. Um, so we found out. I found out that. Um, the local emergency services in Dilly, Texas, have been told not to respond to 911 calls from the detention center. So immigration and the, the core civic take care of whatever medical needs are. And if somebody is really in trouble, they will um, transport them to a hospital in San Antonio and then bring them back to the detention center or release them with their order to appear in immigration court. Um, but for the most part, it's a clinic I assume there's a doctor there, there are nurses, um, but whatever it is that um, these women and children need, for the most part, it's taken care of there and not very well sometimes. Um, and the other part of it is that, um, of course, many of these women and children are suffering from PTSD, SD, and so they are not getting the psychological help that they need which also impacts their ability to tell their story. Um, there is a, a, a psychologist, I think, um, a, a medical, uh, mental health professional of some point it, there, but I'm not sure that the women know about it. Um, one day when I accompanied somebody to the um, asylum office, I was sitting there waiting with her and there were notes around and there was a note that said, you know, if you have trouble, you could come to this group. And I asked the women sitting around, did any of you know about this group that if you, you know, you can go and talk? They said, no, we didn't know that. So um, even though there may be some services there, the women don't know about it. Um, <clears throat> the CAR staff recently found that the clients who are receiving negative decisions are not necessarily the ones with the uh, weakest legal cases. They are women who suffer from uh, PTSD or other mental health issues that prevent them from sharing information to fully support their asylum claim. If a woman is given a second interview, her mental health issue can be used against her as evidence of lack of credibility when she discusses issues that she didn't bring up in the first interview. So it's very difficult. Um, there is, uh, of course, um, difficulty for them to talk, we always, say you can talk to us about anything. Whatever you say to us is totally confidential. We will not tell anybody. Um, we do not report to immigration. We do not tell anybody. You will tell your story at the interview. We won't have anything to do with it. They still are reluctant sometimes. And sometimes, uh, there was a woman actually who um, I heard about. I didn't talk to her, but um, she had been told by the other women um, that maybe she shouldn't tell the asylum officer that she had been raped in her country because that might be an indication that she was part of a gang. 
Um, and so she didn't, and she received a negative. And when she talked to the staff, um, she, she said she had been raped, and, but she didn't tell them. Now, why didn't you tell them? Well, because, you know, I thought that they would hold it against me. No, you have to tell them. So she had to reopen her case, and she did get through. Um, but women have also been raped right before they crossed the border in Mexico. Mexico is a dangerous place for um, Central American families to get through. Um, and so um, some of them are still traumatized by that experience, as well as whatever happened to them in their own country. Um, and the stories women tell are horrific, are just horrific. Um, when I see preteen boys or preteen girls with their moms, I know why they are here. The boys at 11 or 12 get recruited by the gangs. If they refuse, then they're threatened, their families are threatened, um, and they don't know what to do. If by the time a girl turns 11 or 12, the gangs come and tell her, you're ready. You're ready to be my girlfriend. By girlfriend, they don't mean that boy. They mean the gang. So if the girl refuses, they are um, kidnapped, gang raped, tortured, and killed. And I heard one woman told me that um, the gangs, and I don't remember which country, it could be Honduras, um, will call the mom while they're doing this so the mom can hear their daughter screaming. And I asked another woman later on, I'm like, I couldn't believe that, but I asked another woman, she said, yes, it happened to my neighbor. That's why she brought her daughter here. So when, you, when I see these you know, 11, 12, 13 year old girls, I know why they're here, and boys. Um, so part of the interview are questions to establish that there are no other options for this family other than asylum. Um, there's no way for these women to go and get help from the police. Because in those countries, the police are either connected to the gangs, and so the gang finds out immediately that somebody has made a complaint, or they're afraid of the gangs, and they don't do anything. They can't move because gangs control certain areas, and if they try to move to another area, they're killed because they're from a rival gang area, or that their local gang will find out and go after them. Um, the person's address, say that, these women tell me this, I haven't seen an ID, but the, the women tell me that their address is on their ID, so they can't lie and say, no, i just coming, you know, my, coming to stay with my aunt and I'm from this area. Your address is there and they, they ask you for your ID. The gangs ask you. Sometimes the women are running from abusive husbands. Um, the woman I mentioned with the bullet scars, she was shot by her husband. Um, as I mentioned, the rates of femicide are very high in those countries and women get very little support even from their own families. Um, other women have small businesses or other families have small businesses and are being extorted. Sometimes part of the family has already co come to the U.S. and so when gang members find out that they have a relative here, they think that the relative here should be able to send money um, and so they have these huge, you know, exorbitant extortion demands um, when obviously the people who are here are barely making enough money to support themselves and their families. Um, and a lot of times, of course, the trip is costly um, to come from Central America to the U.S. border um, through coyotes most of the time. Um, and so usually there's not enough money for the whole family to come. So one woman told me that her daughter had uh, been um, threatened by the, the gang, and so the family met and said, you go, the, the mother and the daughter came, but the husband and the, her two sons had to stay behind. Um, it's just heartbreaking for these um, families to talk about this, about who they left behind, um, and knowing that they're not even sure they're gonna be able to stay, um, and what's gonna happen in the future. Um, 
And there have been significant changes since the change in uh, the administration. Even before the inauguration last year, asylum seekers were being told that there was no asylum in the U.S. anymore. Women told me that they were told the laws had changed, um, which of course is not true. They're also sometimes told that, that if they don't turn around and go back, they'll be turned over to Mexican immigration, and Mexican immigration is far worse than U.S. immigration. Um, Mexican women are told that there's no room for Mexicans in the U.S. anymore and that they don't qualify asylum, which is untrue. Um, in the visitation things, in the visitation center, things change over time as well. When I first went, there was a room in the back um, that had toys and coloring books and a TV monitor where they um, were showing cartoons for the kids while the moms were talking to us. There was a staff person assigned, assigned there to, um, to watch the kids and keep things in order. The next time I went, there was no staff person, but the room was still open. At some point, the toys were taken out. Um, when I asked why, they said, oh, because the staff complained that the kids would fight over the toys, so they just took them out. Um, there were, the first time I went, there was a refrigerator um, that was there with snacks that the kids could take, um, apples, juice, uh, little snack bars, um, gone. The only thing that's there now is a jug of that fracking water if they're thirsty. Um, when I went, uh, last year I was there in February um, for Valentine's Day. I spent several holidays there. Um, I was there for Valentine's Day last year and um, I asked permission because I had taken some little cut out Valentines. Um, that I bought at Michael's, so I asked one of the staff people if I could give it to the children, because we can't do anything without, we, we're not allowed to give the kids anything. Um, we can't give them any food or water. We can't um, pick them up or carry them. We can't hug the clients. So I asked, it's Valentine's Day, and I brought these little Valentines, can I give them to the kids? And they said yes. So periodically, you know, they get a little something, um, but not much. Um, some of the children won't go to the room. They're, they're very small and they don't want to leave their moms. Understandable because they have seen people disappear. People that they know and love disappear from their sight and they don't see them again and so they're not going to leave their mothers. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes they're there. Uh, it gets very noisy. So my compadre has only gone back once because he doesn't like tr crying children. It's very noisy. Children are crying. They're all sick. Um, and um, while I was helping one woman fill out her, her forms, her information, um, I asked her how she had uh, crossed the border, and she said, over the fence. I said, okay. I said, and your son? And she said, and, and they, they tied my son up, and they pulled him over on a rope, and he turned to me, and he was like five or six, he was a little one. He said, como una piñata. <laughs> I was like, heartbreak. Can you imagine this mom? She gets over and then she's waiting to see if her son is going to make it over. I have a, a friend, personal friend of mine, who was in that situation. She was in the U.S. and her sister was bringing the, her ch three children over and she was waiting to see if they were going to make it. I, as a mom, cannot imagine, cannot imagine what these women have gone through and then to get here and have to go through that to try, still trying to reach safety, still trying. <clears throat> um, and, the, and the other thing was, you know, as I said, the kids are sick. There was a woman who had an older son, like 12, and while I was talking to her, um, filling out the intake forms, I noticed that he was very lethargic. I said, she said, oh, my son is very sick. And she was, she was on the verge of tears. She said, I shouldn't have come. I shouldn't have come. My son is so sick. They, I said, have you gone to the Yes, my son is still sick. He's got a fever. And I touched him, and he was burning. <clears throat> so part of the other advocacy work that we do at, at CARA is to send letters, memos, emails to uh, the uh, administration there of the detention center about issues like this. Um, so we sent back a letter with her, a piece of paper with her that said, see this child now, he's very sick. Um, so 
she was ready. She was ready to deport herself, to just say, just deport me. Um, and the other women said, you've come this far. You've taken, you know, you've already undergone so much. Just wait, just wait. You're going to talk to, you know, we're, we're here. It only takes a few more days, maybe. Wait and see what happens. So when we were able to get the clinic to see him again, the next day she came back and he was just a totally different child. Um, he was hungry, <laughs> he was active, and I said, are you feeling better? He said, yes. So um, again, the medical services there are not the best. So those are also areas where um, the CARA volunteers step in to try and help the families. We tell them, tell us anything that you need while you're here, we're your attorneys. After you leave, we can't help you, but while you're here, talk to us about anything that you need. Sometimes it's complaints about their roommates, but whatever, we're here. <clears throat> so over the last years, not only the attitude of some of the Border Patrol agents has changed, but so has the law. Um, there is an overall criminalization of uh, immigrants, as you know, that's why TPS, that's why DACA, that's why um, raids, um, uh, immigration agents in courts, um, all of that stuff has to do, as you all know, with the current administration and the climate being created. Um, in December, an operating policies uh, and procedures memorandum was issued that is less favorable to children. The memo that it replaced um, only applied to unaccompanied minors. Uh, but now this one applies to all children, um, all cases involving unmarried individuals under the age of 18. The policies are less child friendly. So while previous policies allow the judge to establish a child appropriate hearing environment, the new policy doesn't have that language. The new policy adds language such as Legal requirements, including credibility standards and burdens of proof, are not relaxed or obviated by juvenile respondents. There's also the use of illegal alien language in the memo, rather than using terms like respondent or alien that was in previous memos. Again, part of the trend um, in policies that's affecting children. Um, Situations that will get positive decisions change from time to time, um, no matter how strong the facts are. So volunteers will receive updates um, on what is no longer working, such as land disputes, gang girlfriend cases, single fe female heads of households. Um, they also provide information about what legal theories are working, such as a woman seen as property in domestic violence relationship um, that she's unable to leave, uh, family-based, threats to children um, if, if the mom fails to pay or if the family fails to pay, witness informant or anti-gang political opinion with a clear order, resistance, and persecution. Um, <clears throat> advocates have filed a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties of the Department of Homeland Security after seeing an increase in families being separated. <clears throat> There has been a strategy voiced that separating families, including young children, will serve as a deterrent, deterrent to others. As I'm sure you will agree, family unity is a fundamental right protected by US and international law. Among the cases cited in the complaint is that of a Guatemalan woman who is separated from her five and 14-year-old children and her husband. She left after her 21-year-old had been murdered. Her children have been placed in a shelter in New York, and she is in a detention center in California, and so is her husband. That was as of December when it was filed. <clears throat> While I was in the staff room one day, I saw something a little girl had written who had been there. There once was a girl. She was eight years old and liked to play basketball. She told me she liked to play outside, but really she didn't like to be locked up. Why do they lock up children in the US? Why do they lock up children in the US? I don't know what happened to that little girl. <clears throat> um, so what can you do to help? Um, you can go to the website for caraprobono.org, um, which 
tells you how you can donate, volunteer, and after you volunteer, you can um, do things remotely. So you can do paperwork remotely, or I have done um, by phone uh, preps um, for, for women when there aren't enough volunteers there. And advocacy, because people don't know this is happening. People do not know this is happening and wouldn't, sometimes don't believe you when you tell them that this is happening in the US. Um, there is right now um, on the website a notice about uh, college interns for the summer, if you're interested. They are unpaid internships, however, they will help you find funding. As I said, I have very good friends who have always supported the work that I do in Dili. Um, and so there are others like that, um, other people like that who will support your work if you choose to go. Um, and I'm open for questions right now on anything that I've talked about. Yes. Thank you. Yes. This. and came across something that I've been trying to kind of put feelers out of other people have come across. So I've heard a lot of stories about youth traveling with non-parent parental family members and these youth have significant disabilities and still being separated. Um, and so, you know, these stories have been about youth who are deaf and only speak a, a language that was made up in the home or, you know, youth with autism. Um, and the separation is obviously uh, even more extreme than it would be for just the average child. Did you come across any uh, thing like that? Do you know of any activism around disability, uh, like youth with disabilities? That from time to time, the CARA staff and similar projects and the other detention centers, CARA is only one detention center. There's another one in Texas. There's horrible adult <laughs> detention centers where people die um, because there are inadequate um, medical services for them or they commit suicide because it's so horrible to be locked up there and they have no idea how, when they're gonna get out. Um, so I know that there are efforts at the national level and when they are identified, when those issues are identified, I know that CARA gets in contact <clears throat> with um, people working in the other uh, detention centers and they try to locate um, the relatives. We do that anyway when we find out. We always ask the women, did you come in with, other, with others, and who are they, and what are their birth dates, and then we try and look them up and find them. You actually, if they're related, you can get their cases combined. Um, so if one gets uh, approved, then the other will as well. Um, so yes, there are efforts. I'm not, I haven't been part of that, but I know that there are efforts. And I know that there's absolutely no sympathy um, by Border Patrol agents for anybody under any kind of very few. I won't say none, but because some of the women have told me that they have met Border Patrol agents that have been um, helpful to them, but not very many. In the back, yes? Um, so this is such a specific topic of immigration. So how did you come across it and like go into really detail? Like how did you like, I don't know how to say this. How can you like raise awareness for this? Like how did you come across this? and? Through my friend, I, I wouldn't have known about Kara except through my friend. I posted on Facebook, and I have a bunch of people who follow me and who repost it. And so that's the way, <laughs> the only way that I know the word gets out. I did a, a guest blog for um, Latino Policy Forum, and so it went out to all of the, those folks. So. Um, once you become a volunteer, you get weekly updates of what is going on there. So I keep up with what's going on. I haven't planned my next trip, but I will be going back sometime in the spring. Um, so it, it's constant. It's coming here and talking to you. It's hoping that you will go out and talk to people, that you read about this and find out. Um, I, you know, as I said, two of the women are, are here in Chicago. Um, and so I follow up with, with them and they, you know, they have my number to be able to call and try and make sure that they get legal. So I've only talked about the first step in the asylum process, which can take five years. Um, and the way that they leave is the leave, they leave the detention center either um, as the woman with the, with the bullet scars, 
um, they're just released, or the women who, who, for whom they don't have um, interpreters, they leave with an order to appear at an immigration court in whatever city they're planning to go to live with their family or, or friends. Um, or they leave with an ankle monitor, um, and they have to keep that on, and they're, you know, that tracks where they are, and they can't go beyond the city or wherever area they tell them. Um, and until they get an attorney, and somewhere along the line, they can get it removed. Um, or they can post bond if their family has enough money. The bond goes up and down, so it can be $2,000, but it can be five. So um, bond amounts have been going up. So families usually don't have that kind of money, so they leave with an ankle monitor. Um, so yeah, there's, you know, the issues continue. This is only the first step, this one piece. But this one piece is where I, as a U.S. tax-paying citizen, um, find so horrible the way that they are treated before they get into Dili uh, at these Yeleras and Pereras. And there's got to be a better system. And the detention center, no, no child should be in detention, first of all. So, I mean, you know, there's, there's a whole, another whole group about, you know, ending the detention centers. Yes. I have, thank you, Virginia. I have a series of questions. Um, one is um, money, the flow of money into Core City. Uh, where do they get their money? From the government. The government pays them to do this. So, as I said, their stock went way up because they knew that the new administration was going to increase detentions. So, and they've continued to say they're they're planning for uh, expanded. Uh, detention centers. So it's, um, it's a private corporation and they get paid by the federal government. No, I, I, I expected that, but I was wondering if, if you had some information or some data in terms of how much money they actually do oh. receive and the expenses and the, the no, I don't. revenue streams and expenses and so on and so on. So that was one question. Another. Isn't there a law, or is there no law for, um, for how long one can be in detention? Yes. For children in particular, there were lawsuits that were filed by the advocates, and they can only be in a certain amount of days, 30 days, whatever. Um, there's a certain amount of time for a certain part of the country, and then in another part of the country, it wasn't covered by, it was an appellate court decision. It's very complicated. Immigration law is always very complicated. Asylum law is just as complicated and more so because some of it is based on um, challenges that were brought in court, and it depends on whether it's a uh, you know an appellate court decision. Then it only applies to that part of the country. So yes, there you may have heard about a detention center in Pennsylvania where women were being held, women and their children were being held more than a year. Um, I forgot the name of it, um, but. Some of those, I mean, those women went on strike, and then they, the, the administration there said, if you, you know, if you stop the strike, um, you know, we will work on, on getting you released. Some of those women were transferred from there to Dili and deported. So they lied to constantly. Um, um, but yes and no. Yes, there are limits, and they will, you know, go within those limits. So there are people tracking. There's a floor. Is a, there are people tracking the time that um, people are, are there. So there is a limit um, in some areas. And then just very quickly, um, has anybody done any work? Uh, because it's become an international system uh, in terms of detentions. Uh, so I'm thinking of Australia, for one, and La Padusa in uh, Italy, and so on. So is there any kind of like comparative work that you know about in terms of kind of conditions or common conditions that are unfolding at an international scale? I don't. Scale? I don't. Again, this is my volunteer work, so um, I don't. I come back and I go back to my real job. Um, I don't really, um, you know, have time to do a lot of research on what's going on. But it would be interesting because it's, it is a global problem right now. Others? Quick question. Um, you mentioned, touched on domestic abuse, but does the government actually look at domestic abuse as a, 
as an asylum case? In some cases, it, it can be. It can be. If, if the local police and government are not able to protect that woman, or if, as in these countries, the whole culture is um, based on you know, women not having the rights that they do here, uh, you know, so it could be. Depends on the situation. It depends on the extent of of the um, injuries and kind of what the local situation is, and who the abuser is. I mean, if you have an abuser who's a member of a gang, it, you know, you just really don't have anybody to turn to. Even anecdotally, have, is there a talk about how that's? Uh it's not taken as seriously given the uh, climate, the political climate? By the asylum officers? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the first level, this critical, critical, credible fear, sorry, credible fear interview is really kind of a low um, hurdle to, to go over. Once they get to whatever city they're going to and to the immigration court and they file their actual application for asylum, they then have to have more evidence. They, it then becomes a higher burden of proof that they have to show. So that's when it gets more complicated. For the first one, it's not as difficult to get past that first step, which is the credible fear interview. So is there any indication that that's getting higher and higher? I don't know. I don't know. Yes? Um, so out of the thousands of women and children that are there, what are the percentage of them actually coming out like, with, um, successfully? Out of there, we have, uh, Cara has a pretty good success rate. Those who eventually will get asylum is not that high. So it depends, again, on where they're going. So sometimes I ask the women if anybody's going to Atlanta, and some, several people wear, do you, have, do you know anybody else in the country? Because Atlanta has a very low percentage of successful asylum petitions. So it depends on you know, where the court is that they're going to. Yes? So a couple of things. So one, just follow up to if you know what the Chicago area is success, asylum success rate is. And second, uh, well, what if, how does Kata negotiate this, this, this position it's in? Like, you know, it's one thing to be running a shelter in, in a border city. It's a completely different thing to be doing these services within, you know, <laughs> within in the detention, in, center. In the detention center. And like, you know, so there's you're, strict rules about what they can do and what they can't do. How do they advocate, right, they, at the same time they do. <laughs> they advocate with the CCA staff as well as with um, immigration. Um, so most of the detention centers are hours away from a major city. So this one is an hour and a half maybe away from San Antonio, south. But the one in, um, the horrible one in Georgia is like three hours away from Atlanta. So it's hard to get attorneys out there. It's hard to get advocates out there. It's hard to get, you know, for people to even see their relatives there to find the place. So um, they're intentionally far away, so it makes it harder. Um, but yes, CAR is able to keep a fairly good um, relationship. But then, you know, there are things that happen. So. First time I was there, Cara had two offices that they could use for their files and the computers, and we keep snacks in there. Um, and next, one of the next times I went, it was like, oh, we only have one office now. I'm like, why? Don't know, they just decided that we only needed one office, which was very crowded. Again, they have to keep all the files there, the computers, the fax, you know, everything that, that we need to, to, to do the work. Um, following time I went, oh, we're back to two again. So it's negotiating. Um, and there are times when, uh, so we have to go through metal detectors like everybody, you know, at an airport. But so, is, so does the staff. Um, but the staff have these clear plastic bags that they use to take their lunch and everything in. So they just go through and they know their staff. For us, they like 
you have to go through that. Okay. And then one day they said, no, you have to empty everything out of your bag. Your computer, your whatever, anything. Then, oh, you can't have this chapstick. I said, I brought it in all week. Nope, depends on who's on duty. So, you know, they kind of tell us what any rule, new rules are about we, what we can and cannot do. You have to wear closed shoes, you have to wear, you know, sleeves, you can't wear short skirts, you can't, you know, there's like a whole bunch of rules. Um, so we do what we have to do. Um, it's cold in there, so it could be 105 outside, but you go in there and you have to take a jacket or sweater. Okay, um, you do what you have to do. But they do, you know, kind of help us. And this, the staff, the CCA staff, are, you know, for the most part, they're, they're okay. You know, they, they don't treat the people badly. Um, it's a job. You know, it's South Texas. Where are you going to work in South Texas? You work for immigration or you work for one of these companies or you go do oil. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I get along with most, of, with most of the people who work there and they've seen me a few times, so I go and I say hello. But, you know, there's sometimes you'll get this one guy who will come and kind of say, okay, you know, what's your name? Yes. Uh, all right, so this is, and he kind of reads you the riot act. The women will be coming here. Well, we know this already, but, you know, he's got to kind of, tell us that he's there. Okay, fine. I, I, I don't want this on tape. <laughs> I asked, I asked um, they all introduced themselves, and, uh, and I said, oh, and what's your name? Uh, what's your first name? Because I call them all by their first names, right? We call each other Mr. Okay, Mr. Gonzalez. Okay. <laughs> so I call them whenever I go. We and I become friends, but I have to keep calling him Mr. Gonzalez. Okay, whatever. Whatever. Um, what would be the like requirements for like volunteering? Is there like I mean, in terms of like DACA students, are they able to like go in and volunteer, or is, the, is there a background check, or how do they? I mean, it's too. It might be too risky, right, to have somebody. A DACA person? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I would uh, send an email to Kara and ask about that. Um, when we go in, we have to take our IDs and they take them and they give us a, a number and they keep our ID on a little board. So I don't know. Um, I don't know. And for the most part, Immigration it's, itself is not in the detention center. It's the, it's the civilian staff, but they're there. I mean, as I said, the one day I saw them, it was because they were coming in to deport somebody. So, um, you know, I just don't trust anybody now. So I would check, but you can ask. Um, and the, the other thing is that, um, Many times when they leave there, the group Raices is in San Antonio. And I have gone, one day, things, strange things happen. One time I was going and I saw that, um, it was in the newspapers, that all of a sudden immigration was releasing like two or 300 women in the middle of the night and they just dropped them off in San Antonio. That time I think they did leave them with at Raices. Sometimes they just go and drop them off at the during the hurricane, they dropped them off at the bus terminal. No buses, and so there they were. Raises found out and went to get them. So um, when these two or 300 women were, were um, dropped off, don't know why they were emptying out the place at the time, but they dropped them off and um, Raises called all the churches in San Antonio. San Antonio was incredible. They like everybody pitched in and people were sending in stuff um, from through you know Amazon uh, that you know they had a list diapers this and that so um, that group Raices is, is some place that um, somebody could volunteer at which is safer because it's in San Antonio um, but um, anytime after you volunteer there once then you're on their list and you get these weekly updates but you can also do um, work a lot of the uh, up uploading of information on their computer system, which has to happen because 
I can interview somebody today, but tomorrow they get a negative. Whoever comes in to do that piece has to see what happened. Um, so it's critical to get that information uploaded as soon as possible. And there's, so sometimes there's, there's a woman who comes in from San Antonio who sits there and does that kind of uh, entering of information and copying of the, of the um, intake sheets. Um, critical work, but it's just you know office work, but it's critical. She doesn't usually talk to um, the women, the clients. So there's different things that can be done. But part of it, again, is this advocacy of letting people know what your U.S. tax dollars are going to. It's heartbreaking. It really is heartbreaking, yes. So as my question is the same as the one you posed at the end of you know, your, your talk, or the other post by the, the, the one girl. Why is it happening? And why are they bringing families in detention? These detention centers were opened under the previous administration because of the number of um, refugee families coming. They didn't know how to handle them, so they created these, these centers. So that's the why. Um, there still is a large number of um, uh, families coming because things are so bad in those countries. Why are things so bad in those countries is the topic of another presentation you should do here about U.S. involvement in Central America over the years. Um, and drugs and guns and stuff like that. But for our purposes, they're still coming. They are still coming. And yes, everybody's heard about the new administration and their anti-immigrant everything going on in this country, they are still coming because the alternative is my daughter's going to die, my son's going to get dragged into the gangs. Um, they're afraid. They are afraid. So can you clarify, so TPS, we heard a couple of months ago to German, that's all going to start, right? Right. What will that do to the women and children who are in the detention centers? That's the first part. For, they're applying for asylum, not TPS. However, it affects them because their families here, many of them are on TPS. So they're coming and they're, you know, moving to Chicago with, with their sister, that sister may be on TPS and the TPS is going to be gone. So now her sister's at risk as well. For the, temporarily she's going through the process, so she is protected in some way, but now her sister's not going to be. So it's the family that's already here that has TPS um, that's going to be impacted directly and then impacting the women who are seeking asylum and men because eventually the families get back together hopefully um, if they came with the uh, with their husbands or partners then when they when they get through that first step they are reunited in whatever city they're going to live in um, so yes it impacts the family indirectly and what does asylum get is there like a like a is it kind of like a resident green card? Is there a pass to citizenship? What it's, is? Again, I'm not an immigration and I'm not an but asylum attorney. Yeah, but that's, that's um, it's, it's, I mean, it would be permanently. They would be able to stay permanently. So eventually residence and potentially citizenship, I think. And something else really quickly. Is Cara learning what is happening to the women and children who are back? They hear sometimes, so some women have been, okay, so they're just in the, in the notice this week. Um, there was a woman who was grabbed by a border patrol agent and she was shaken and the, the daughters started crying and said, don't kill my mom. My dad was already killed. She was sent, left, she was sent to go back, stay in Mexico, and uh, spent a month in a Mexican detention center, which was not good, sent back to her country, 
but came back again because she would have died in her country. So she turned around and came back. Um, so uh, we know that sometimes the unaccompanied minors who are sent back are killed. Sometimes they're killed here too, but um, gangs will find them. Um, so yes, sometimes their worst fears are realized. Yes. I just want to say a couple of things. Um, one is that um, I belong to a church called <coughs> Willow Creek, and they, if, I'm just saying this for reference, if um, any of these families need help, they have a whole, a whole uh, building, a store, you know, where they can get groceries, they can get clothes, they can get a lot of help, and, you know, they've done this for, they've prepared the, the, the church community to understand what the immigrant communities are going through. You know, it's, um, it's not just the uh, South Americans that right. are from the Middle right. East, from other places. So there is that. And I'm trying to, you know, wiggle my way in there so in the future I see myself as a liaison more for the Latino community or the immigrant. Yeah, it's a question of getting them there. Somebody else yeah, said, Right. Somebody, one of my friends had mentioned that too, and I said, you know, she doesn't have transportation. Yeah, it's, it, that, that, I forgot, it's in South Barrington. Right. I've and seen yeah, it. it. So I, I know that, that that's the barrier, is just the distance. But people locally, as I said, for this family, when I put out a, a request, people donated things, money, clothes. One of my friends took her to the clinic. Um, so, you know, it's, what can be done, yeah. you know, as easily as possible. And my other comment is this: I wanted to say to everyone here present, you know, my respects to Virginia Martinez because she is being at the front and center of so many and you know issues, and and to defend us. And she has a whole history. Um, she has, like she says, she has very good friends. She has tons of friends because. Uh, we all come from the same kind of uh, commitment. Uh, it's all of us more or less around the same age, and you know there's no question that you can approach any one of us and we're just going to say, yes, yeah, sure, why not? My home, my car, <laughs> you know, we, we step up when the call is needed. And I think right now I'm, I'm honored that the Hino Artemis is here because it is a call to, the, to you, to the youth, to the students. You've got the power, you've got the you know, the, the, the young age to, you know, help and raise those, this voice of awareness within the university and out in the community, you know. So to emulate what, what Virginia Martinez and some of us have done already, you know, to step up and get going. And we know you are doing it, but the need is so great in so many different communities that we do need to step up. The attacks are from all sides, yeah. so I know that you're all doing things. This is just more information about another area um, that's impacting the community. Yes? Um, you said multiple times that you're talking to these women and they talk about the things they've been before in the detention centers. They say, unfortunately, my tax money is going to support these detention facilities. Like, what can we do to kind of help, besides advocacy, like, or I guess advocacy can be a big part? Like prevent or kind of help the quality standards for those detention facilities besides not You know, um, the first or second time that I um, went down there, I came back and I met with um, Senator Durbin's staff, chief of staff, about it. And she actually told me that he knew, um, had heard complaints about it. The U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, I think, had done a report about it. Immigration Service itself has investigated, um, but they don't pay attention to any of the recommendations. Uh, he actually was planning to go down, and then the election happened, and so, you know, he's trying to defend DACA and DPS and everything else at this point, so he never went. But, I, you know, I've never tried talking to our other senator, and I've never tried, you know, going, I did try to talk to the congressman about it, but, talk to the federal representatives, the senators and the, and the congressmen, 
uh, about trying to get that corrected, changed somehow. Um, again, those, those um, yeleras and perreras should not be used that way. They should not have children in there at all. Um, and they certainly shouldn't keep them there more than a few hours or a day, yes. But aren't all of those senators, I mean, under this administration and the last, I mean, uh, basically just complacent in the creation of these centers and the tired immigration crisis? Yes, because nobody knew what to do with uh, thousands of people coming from Central America. Um, and so, yes, it's a huge question about what, how can we help? How can we do, do something about everybody? No, can we accept everybody in the world? Because that's what the Republican response is. We can't accept everybody in the world um, who's you know, coming because of persecution. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, how much food does, does this place throw away every day? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, so, uh, you know, it's a, huge, it's a huge question about how can we, and uh, you know, well that's, and then some of them will say that's, you know, that's, their government should take care of that. They're, you know, they need to stay in their country and fix it. Well, you know, we messed up their countries. <laughs> so we can't just like turn around and say, oh, we, you know, okay, let, let, let them deal with it. We go in and we meddle in other countries and then we walk away and say, oh, it's, they're messed up. They're, you know, let them take care of it. We have a responsibility. And again, these are children. But I also think that what throws a, another complication into this is that these places have become now, you know, privately owned, mm -hmm. right? So they're lobbying mm -hmm. for kids. Oh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. This is, this is no different than incarceration, mm -hmm. right? So this is, some, you know, pretty complex here. Yeah. Yes. I just have another uh, recommendation for everyone else. We had a program last semester from the Detention Watch Network, um, which also does a lot of work in detention and deportation um, infrastructure and machinery and a lot of the, the horrors. And they have a defund hate campaign that's really focused on kind of the amount of money of our tax money that goes to fund this, these places. Um, and so if you guys want to look into that, that also might be a way to like think about you know stopping the flow, supporting this stuff. It is difficult work. It's difficult to be down there. Um, you know, as I said, um, the, first, the first time I was there and Sandra asked me what my, what my um, reaction was, I cried. Um, and I do periodically cry. Um, but it, it pissed me off. You don't want me pissed off. So I have to go and do something about it. I just cannot believe that we treat people like that. Yes. Um, I also want to mention, again, the postcards. That's one of the quickest ways that you can take action right now. And we will be collecting them and mailing them for you with a message of support back to the GPS or a message of support or against, um, for example, the detention centers or the, the, your taxes going there. Um, so that's one of the quick action steps that we can take today before you leave. Um, Speak. Write, walk, march. So I have, this is not my only issue, of course, I have a big butterfly that I drew, which I take to all the demonstrations. And people say, well, what does that stand for? I said, it stands for the rights of immigrants, it stands for peace, it stands for beauty, it stands for anything that I want to talk about that, that particular day. But I will go out there, my kids think I'm nuts. Um, uh, it's okay. It's okay, you know? I think that you cannot be quiet when you see these things happening. And because I went down there that first time, I can't stop. Um, and so I figure out a way to do it um, so that, that I can help. So however you think you can help on this or any other issue, do it. Thank you.